Hi, this is Meg Riley, and you've joined us for, I think, the largest ever gathering on The View. Today, we'll be talking about changes in guidelines for UU ministers in the UUMA, and I'm really excited to have a bunch of folks with that. But before we get there, Christina, how are you? I'm doing well. This is Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia, where it's gorgeous outside, and yet I can't go out there because Virginia is trying to kill me with all the pollen. So I know I have fellow pollen sufferers out there. Um, it's our time of the year to just stay in <laughs> air conditioning. Love you all so much. Asia, how's it going with you? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser. I'm in Seattle, Washington, although right after the show, I'm headed to the airport to go to Houston, where I'll be doing a workshop on race and preaching on Sunday. So I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, my son is suffering from allergies here in Seattle, too. I don't know what, I guess it's the same, Colin, but um, so I, I, he can commiserate with you. Uh, Michael, how are you? I'm doing well. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino in Peekskill, New York, um, where it is spring here. Also, the plants are busy reproducing and uh, the eyes are itchy and, and the whole nine yards. Uh, life, is, life is good here. It's a beautiful spring day in New York. Um, and of course, Margalie Belazaire, you are on the tech deck today. You wanna say hi to everyone? Hello, just hello. As you know, I'll be monitoring and well, looking for your questions and comments so we could make sure that the panel here um, hear what you have to say and hear your questions and so on. So I am coming to you from uh, Connecticut. Uh, I do suffer from allergies, but it hasn't been too bad for me right now. So <laughs> I won't go much more into it. And back to you, Meg. Well, I will say I was in Boston. The minute I got there, I started sneezing. I sneezed for two days, took Flonase in order to preach 20 minutes without sneezing, made it, got home, haven't sneezed since. So it's still winter here is the, is the moral of that story. I had never had allergies before, though, and it was unpleasant. I'll just say that. But thank you for good coaching on Facebook about what to do. I bought all the products. So we have such a big group today that we're going to jump right in after one important conversation about something really cool that happened in UU World. Uh, Blue, the Black Lives of UU, really promoted and pushed forward and hosted uh, Babies in Bailout. And Aisha, you want to talk about that from the Washington perspective? Yeah, so uh, I think 22 sites all over the country hosted a live Facebook panel uh, watch party. And uh, the Bellevue congregation, where I'm the D director of lifelong learning, we hosted one. And it was so deeply compelling. It is anyone can watch it. And I really highly recommend it. And it gave a perspective. Uh, there were it was all black women. Uh, it was hosted by Paige Ingram and um, Southerners on New Ground. There were two representatives from there. There were folks who were formerly incarcerated, who work with uh, people who are uh, currently incarcerated and the, and the perversion of putting people in cages. Uh, and it, it was, it was I, I can't really quite describe the impact spiritually and emotionally of watching this conversation. It was, it was and, and everyone who attended um, were, were deeply impacted and, and really have felt like a, a spiritual call to action. You couldn't really w sit through that, watch it and have any other result other than we have to stop, stop doing this. We have to stop engaging in this as a, as a group. So kudos to Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. There is, um, I don't, is, is the fundraiser Lori Sertoski posted, uh, hosted by Church of the Larger Fellowship? Because right now there's- No, money. that one's by no. ARE. She, okay, uh, allies for allies racial, racial equity. equity. So um, I don't know if we can get that link up for folks to to um, fundraise. If I, want to, if I want to add, it is a uh, an event that's being to get between, together by CLF ARE and another congregation in California, name of which is escaping me right now. So it is going to be part of the uh, watch party that. Um, we're having on Tuesday the 7th. Well, those are two different things. There's the watch party on May 7th at 8 Eastern. And then Lori also posted a fundraiser uh, through Allies for Racial Equity to which we can all donate. And is there anything better for Mother's Day as a gift than reuniting a parent and a child? So 
I feel like, you know, some gifts you kind of give them, you don't really know what they do. This is the most concrete gift in the world to help create more love and justice. So I hope everybody will give what you can. And um, yeah, and I hope if you missed it, which I did, I was on an airplane at the time, um, CLF will be doing it Tuesday, May 7th, 8 p.m. Eastern, so it's not too late. So come and join us online for hours. So we are going to start introducing guests, and I forget who said that they would start this by naming. We're going to start with two committees that are here today, Paul Langston Daly and Kim Wilson chairing two different committees and someone besides me. And I'll apologize again for this iPad. It looks like I'm not looking at you. That's because the camera is to the side and I'm gonna fix my computer. It's really gonna happen someday. And before we do though, I do just need to say that here in Minneapolis, it is a very grieving time. Uh, we had, uh, black Somali police officer who's gonna spend many years in jail for killing a white woman. Not that every police officer who murders someone shouldn't be in jail, but the same district attorney, the same everybody who didn't care about Philando Castile, didn't care about Jamar Clark, suddenly are really just appalled that police would kill someone. And it is there is so much racism and Islamophobia in the whole process of the whole trial that it's, it's just, creepy and awful and sad from every single direction, just sad from every single direction. So I just need to name that, that my hometown here in Minneapolis is a hard place right now and um, very, very evidence of white supremacy and that the so-called blue line is a white line and here we are. So I just needed to name that because it's very present with me, but I'm very excited to talk about changes at the UMA, which hopefully are gonna help us to look at white supremacy and other issues. So someone's gonna lead this by introducing people. So, hi, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Paul Langston Daly and I have been um, serving as the chair of the UUMA Guidelines Accountability Committee for the last year and a half or so. Um, and we have been, we were charged by the UUMA board to uh, review our guidelines in terms of the accountability piece and to think about ways that we might better support this culture of learning and, and um, covenant that we've been really kind of stressing for the last at least couple of years. So, uh, and, I, and I just wanna say, you know, I've been around for a little more than 20 years and it's really heartening to see these changes happening in our, in our ministry. Um, Kim Wilson has been working on the ethics committee and I'll let her introduce herself and uh, provide a little information about their part in all of this. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we uh, also have been working together for about a year and a half. Um, I chair the committee, as you said, the, um, and that is uh, the ethics committee. And we've been charged with studying the existing guidelines and proposing revisions that uh, clarify and strengthen our professional standards for conduct and um, that come out much stronger against behaviors that perpetuate white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and other systems and structures of oppression. Uh, when we first read that, we said, oh, sure, no problem. <laughs> it was a little bit daunting, but um, we have worked together and we actually have made a lot of progress and we're very proud. Uh, I, yeah, we're proud of the work that we have done and we are feeling very hopeful and I believe the board shares our perspective that um, we're really introducing a new way of being together and being respectful and accountable toward one another. Thank you. I wonder, since there are people here from a couple of committees and Wendy Williams, the incoming president of the UUMA, if you could just go around and uh, introduce yourself. So after you say who you are, if you could call on somebody else who's here, so we're not waiting and awkward. Um, and let's just start with Christiana Willie McKnight. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Christiana Willie McKnight. I am on the UUMA board with the portfolio of policy. And I have been serving as the liaison to the accountability committee um, for a while. Um, and I am here mostly just to listen and to answer any questions that would be specifically related to 
the work of what the board has done. I, it did occur to me that as I was looking around with all these people in the room, um, one thing that I weirdly have is the historical knowledge of how the board came to the conclusion that we needed this. <laughs> it was a very long conversation and we were sure we needed one guidelines committee. And then we said, no, actually we think we need to do two. Um, so that's why I'm here, glad to be here. Uh, Wendy. Wendy, you're muted. Thank you. So my name is forgetful Wendy Williams. Um, and I am uh, the incoming uh, president for the UUMA board. I've been shadowing Cheryl M. Walker this year and uh, attending board meetings. So uh, this guidelines revision, the year of study will be happening in my uh, first year uh, of board leadership. And we'll be having an interesting ministry days a year from, from this coming June. So. That is why I am here and I will call on Matthew. Hey everybody, uh, I see some very familiar faces. It's good to see all of you. I don't know how many folks know that um, Aisha is the director of lifelong learning at my home church where my mom is a member. So it's always great to see you from across the world. Um, I am a member of the accountability committee uh, and um, uh, along with some of the other folks in the group and my particular task is the bylaw writing job. So. Um, when we get to specific, specific questions about the language in the accountability procedure, I am happy to talk about those. And I will call on another member of our committee, John Alou. Hi, John Alou Johnstone. And um, I have been a minister for 26 years now. And um, I'm really excited to be part of this because some of the hardest stuff that I've dealt with as a good officer and as a chapter leader has been when our colleagues are out of covenant and what to do with that and how to confront that and it's been some of the hardest stuff i've dealt with and this i these changes i think are going to bring us some tools to really do a, an entirely different approach um so i'm really excited to be part of the committee and i'm really excited to be here talking about it and I think we got everybody, right? Yeah. Terrific. So I love that when this is put out on the web, which we have put the link up, it says, this is a big deal. So tell me, Paul Langston Daly, what is a big deal? So, um, so this is a big deal in a lot of ways. There are, our guidelines have, have been less than stellar um, and, and less than adequate for our needs, uh, particularly as things have changed over the course of the last 10 or 15 years or 20 years even. Um, and so this is an opportunity really for us to, to look at the guidelines and find a way to respond to, to our colleagues, uh, to our congregations, to our association in a way that um, that embraces and embodies our spiritual and religious understandings. So that means that we're grounding all of this in relationship and we're grounding all of this in covenant and we're grounding all of this in the desire to learn more together um, because we're better when we learn more together. So, you know, this is a, this is a major culture shift for our congregation or for our, for our ministers association. And, you know, this is, been complicated. Uh, you know, I remember the conversation we had around um, sexual ethics a few years ago. And, and, you know, this is a shift for us to really move to this place where we can say, we want to hold each other accountable in a way that is both responsible and loving. And I think that our guideline, you know, that, that, that these changes to the guidelines do that. And I think the work the ethics committee has done has done a really good job of, of framing that in a way that um, allows us to move forward more effectively than we have been. Kim, let's hear about that. How, how does the frame help? Um, well, just briefly, uh, part of our process was to do interviews of a broad range of people who have had um, 
a broad and deep exposure to our UU ministry. Um, and we learned a lot about their concerns and we heard themes and that helped to guide us toward the most problematic areas um, where things weren't clear or things just weren't addressed um, as with um, bullying and emotional abuse, for example. Um, and uh, we then uh, actually sent out our first draft to a number of different organizations and entities, including regional lead people. And uh, they encouraged us to work more on certain areas. So uh, one of those areas, which um, I am feeling very good about because it's responding to a lot of frustration um, on the part of, of many people, which is how we speak to one another and about one another when there's a problem. And it may not be sexual misconduct. It may not be another form of misconduct. It may be, it may be incompetence or it just may be you know, mismanagement. So um, we have had a culture of Mm, tiptoeing around and not feeling that it's okay to call out somebody on their behavior or go to someone else and say, hey, I'm observing, observing this and it's, it's a problem. So a lot of harm has been allowed to continue because of that culture. And so we are proposing uh, a way of mm, giving people permission and in fact, saying this is, this is your ethical obligation. If you see harm occurring, you need to speak up and here are some ways that you can do it in love, not unkindly and just be truthful and, um, and direct. So that communication and the way we communicate is so important. So one of, um... One of our online uh, viewers is Julica Herman de la Fuente, who um, is coordinating the Covenant Relations Team for Ministry Days at GA in, uh, before GA in Spokane. Uh, and uh, so friend of the show, Julica, nice, nice to have you with us. And Julica asks um, how we're gonna implement or how we could implement this new policy in minister chapters and at our work together in Ministry Days. And I guess that fits in with the larger question that, that I had, which um, I did read this fantastic work and I applaud you for it. Uh, all 24 pages I read, which does not mean that I absorbed all 24 pages of it. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it says things like, um, I agree that I will not be racist. Um, uh, and I, and I'm, I'm boiling it down for, uh, you know, and simplifying it greatly. But what happens when, when our colleagues or I um, don't do that. Like say say I say I say something racist, and and a, like I'll, we'll just use me as an example, right? Because we all know that I say racist things all the time. Um, say I say something racist at uh, ministry days in Spokane, where I will not be. Um, how how does that get dealt with? How does that get implemented uh, within? Uh, I'll just I'll just stop talking and let you all answer. Great, I'd love to take a swing at that, uh, Michael. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that if you do that in Spokane, um, our current procedures, which will not be real until after they're approved in Providence a year later, don't really give any kind of option um, for us to do anything um, other than somebody taking you aside and speaking informally about. It. So say I'm super racist in Milwaukee in two years. Yeah, now we're talking. Let's say this has been approved. Um, uh, so what would happen is that somebody would s decide that you have breached the covenant, which you would have done because the ethics committee's new rules say you you cannot engage in racist speech or behavior. That's a violation of our covenant with one another and a professional obligation. So you're in breach of the covenant. And then somebody would contact a right relations guide. Um, this would be a group of people who have been appointed and trained and identified, and they would call whichever one of them they wanted and say, um, you know, I'm concerned about Michael's behavior. Um, and this is what I observed. And I think this is out of covenant. And the guide would coach the complainant 
on what might be the right response. Right now, our options are basically either do nothing or kick you out. There's no way to bring someone back into covenant that doesn't have a hammer. Um, and so what happens is we don't say anything about most of the kind of middle stuff because there's no, oh, well, we don't want to kick them out, but then there's no way to get people back on track. So the guide would say from a list of eight options, which are included in our um, list of ideas, um, what to do. And that could include anything from calling you up and saying, you got to stop talking now, just be quiet until we can get you to a training and learn to not do this, to we're going to have a mediation, to we're going to have a right relations circle to bring you back with all the people that were in the room when they heard you say that and who were triggered and affected, to you need to go to a training, to you need a caucus with other similarly situated people to learn more. Um, and we'd also talk about what needs to be done to heal those who experience the harm. So if you said something to somebody and now they're feeling like, I'm not really sure I'm important because here's this really beloved minister who said this thing, how do we heal that person's hurt? And the guide would help them walk through what do they need to get back into covenant? What do you need to get back into covenant? If your behavior is repeated, deliberate and continues after intervention, then it could qualify as egregious misconduct under our new rules and you would go to the common ethics panel, uh, which is a new thing. Um, the UUMA and the MFC are working on it um, as we speak, talking about what that looks like, but this would be a way in which um, people would be held to account for the covenant and the common ethics panel would say, your behavior has continued repeatedly after you've been told to stop um, and you, might no longer be in fellowship or maybe suspended from both your fellowship and your membership in the UUMA, the Ministers Association. So that's a brief answer to that particular scenario, but it's a completely different shift. You know, there's also the option of restorative circles and other kinds of there's eight possible interventions, which accumulate in, if necessary, the removal from ministry. So since we're talking about racism, Dawn Fortune, one of our frequent guest hosts, asked, were there people of color engaged in this enterprise, these committees? Yes. <laughs> uh, Linda White is on the um, accountability committee. Um, I don't believe many of you know her son was, was uh, killed a couple of months ago. And so she has stepped back but is still engaged um, and Walter LaFleur is our board member that Wendy is standing in for today, um, who was the board liaison to the um, account of ethics committee. We had them named A and B and then we renamed them halfway through the process. So I still have to do the naming translation in my head. And the, the interviews were extensive. Um, so we interviewed from both committees Oh God, I mean, I don't know how many people, 60 or 70 probably from everybody combined. And there was a high representation of people of color um, throughout as anytime anyone was suggested for an interview, we made every attempt we could to contact them. And most of that was successful. And I spent a good deal of time talking with Leslie Takahashi about the, um, the Commission on Institutional Change uh, and how that fits into this process as well. So we were really, really conscious about that, um, especially given that, you know, the, the makeup of our committee, we wanted to make really sure on our part that we had an, all of the voices that we wanted to include in this conversation. We also reached out to Trust and, um, and Blue and, and Drum and, you know, all of these other groups. So it was important to us that that, that connection, those connections were made. So last year in preparation for the Berry Street, I'm sorry, I'm talking over someone I can't see a minute. Who was that, Asia? was that you? Yeah, I just had a question. Come, in. come but in, you come in. Okay, uh, um, how do you respond to folks uh, who are saying this is policing and don't want identity politics or because, I, so I actually was contacted by both committees <laughs> to uh, different people. So thank you for that. I, I very much appreciated that. Uh, to give feedback and, and my thoughts on the drafts. Um, and I was uh, did a webinar for a UUMA chapter on how to be better process observers and in conversations leading up to the webinar, 
I said, what is the need for this? And they said, well, there were insensitive comments being made at a retreat. And one of the comments from um, a minister was, well, I just want to relax and say what I want to say. And I don't want to be policed or, or I, I'm paraphrasing. I wasn't there, but that was the sentiment I've got. Even when I were at, on the Liberal Religious Educators Association integrity team and the right relations team, um, people would say, you're just policing us. So what, what is your response to that? My response is we need to do better as faith leaders because that's what we're called to be in the world. And the journey is the destination. If we're working towards collective liberation, this is this is the way to get there is to hold each other in love and hold each other and to be accountable. But I'd love to hear your answer. My answer, my answer has to do with the pain that we're hearing on the other side. We're hearing in these interviews we're doing, we're hearing deep pain, people who have been really, really hurt and have been shut down by a, a little thing in our guidelines that says that a colleague shall not speak ill of another colleague. That we decided early on was a big problem and had to go that the only way that we can stop hurting people is to pay attention to when people are hurt. Now, if that sounds like policing, I'm sorry, but you going around being able to say whatever you want to say, whenever you want to say it, is a sure sign of privilege. So I just and, wanted to say, oh, go ahead, Kim. I, I would like to add that um, that kind of a response demonstrates how much of a need we have for education. And this is the other really hopeful part of what we're doing moving forward, uh, working with the UUMA and the MFC. Uh, we are no longer going to be a learned profession, but a learning profession. And if white ministers are going to learn about how much just being part of our white supremacist society is inherently hurting people of color and how much it is hurting. Uh, that's the first step because um, I think there are a number of white ministers and you know none of us is ever there, we're never done because um, the layers of understanding what harm is being perpetuated because of our <clears throat> heteropatriarchal white dominated society, um, they, they will just continue to be uncovered for those of us who have not lived through it day by day. And I think the education is really key because we can say all the words we want, but if people, white people are not understanding the magnitude of the problem, then um, we're not gonna be able to shift attitudes. I also want to just jump in and say that, you know, as ministers, we should be holding ourselves to a higher standard. Like mm -hmm. that to me feels like we're in this calling for a reason. And, you know, sure, I may want to kick back and just not have to worry about what I say, but that's not what I signed up for. Um, and so as a, as a leader, I'm responsible for that. And I think we haven't done a very good job of asking each other to be accountable and responsible to our, our role and our, uh, and our position as clergy. And I think it's important that we, that we do that. And, and this is, an, a, this is a, a, a shift in culture to encourage that and to continue to support that. It's an incredible culture shift. I wanted to say that last year in prep for the Barry Street, I interviewed many people, including a lot of people of color and trans folks and other marginalized folks. And a lot of it isn't like someone made a racist comment. It's an ongoing quality of relationship of little daily um, lack of respect, of, of lack of interest. And so, you know, as I think about this, Somebody posted in the chat, it's going to, this would be really amazing for this culture change to happen. It's such, there are so many relationships that are so profoundly broken with our colleagues. And Christina, you wanted to ask a question specifically. Yeah, so, um, so far the, the main focus of this conversation um, has been around um, ordained clergy people holding each other accountable. Um, which I think is 
is absolutely, um, Ty Resendez de Perez said, you know, the idea, of, the idea of a minister being held accountable for making racist comments is um, such a paradigm shift that I can't even begin to picture a structure of accountability functioning. And, and so I think, you know, to add to that is um, what this looks like from um, like religious education colleagues perspectives. And so much of the time um, when we're talking about harm that has been done um, by our ordained clergy people, it has been in relation to how they um, supervise other religious professionals. And so I think that it would be um, helpful for folks to hear um, now that we've heard a little bit of how that happens, um, you know, minister to minister, ordained person to ordained person, what does this look like um, with other religious professionals? Christina, I'm so glad that you asked that question. And that, um, that was a previous limitation of our guidelines. And we were focused mostly on colleague to colleague uh, behavior. And we have extended it to um, profession, minister professional behavior toward everyone, toward staff, toward colleagues, whether we're uh, co-serving or whether uh, one of us is supervising another toward members of the congregation, even uh, when we're not at work, so to speak, out in the world, we are calling ourselves to be accountable and to behave, um, you know, at a high ethical standard wherever we are and wherever we go. Yeah, and I think I think my question is um, expanding that that there's a culture of expansion that needs to needs to happen around the idea of colleague, right? Yeah. Of that colleague means more than just another ordained clergy person. The colleague can be your relig the religious educator that serves Unitarian Universalism with you. It can be the director of music. It can be the administrator. It can be the membership profession, like that that idea that the UUMA um, has held up for, for a really long time. And I'm just gonna you know, name it that, that this old white boys network um, is the definition of colleague, right? And so I appreciate the systemic part of calling this, um, White supremacy in terms of in terms of the guidelines and and all of this has been fabulous and I'm really excited, um, but I'm just wondering about also the culture shift that needs to happen with it. Yeah, so um, let me say a little bit about that, and I, it's also possible that uh, Christina and Wendy might want to add um, to this that so in addition to the ethical rules that the ethics committee has said about how we behave and how we reflect on our profession um, and what our expectations are toward everybody that we work with um, or serve. Um, you know, we, the common ethics panel that's being imagined here would hold similar standards across religious professional bodies. So um, this would help knit together um, the various professional bodies, including the educators association, musicians, et cetera, administrators, membership professionals. So there's a movement and those professional groups are part of that conversation that I know the UMA um, leaders are having with the UA and the MFC about how do we knit that together. Some of the professional bodies incorporate our, um, the minister's rules with some modifications as appropriate as their own rules. So one thing that we're hoping is that as we, as our rules get better, that'll help everybody. And the more we can be in the same boat together. So those conversations are ongoing. Um, and I think that the big thing that you're lifting up about the culture change is absolutely true. One of the people we interviewed said, these are great words, but if you don't change the culture, like you have one, you have some paragraphs about changing the culture, you need more paragraphs about changing the culture because only with the cultural shift do the rules matter. My hope and our whole kind of thing as we've been doing this is sometimes technical change leads to adaptive change. Sometimes you fake it till you make it. Sometimes the new rules help you do better 
And that begins to get people in the shift. So one of the things we call for that's really important is an annual review by these right relations guides, the people who are working on these issues, to say, what, what do we need to be clear about? What do we need to learn as a body? Do we need more training on how to be a better supervisor? Yes, I think that's gonna come up quickly. Do we need better examples of covenants between staff members and ministers and other staff members who work in the same setting? Yeah. So they're gonna, as they see the problems bubble up, because right now there's no, other than antidote, there's no pattern analysis to say what are the things that come up over and over again in different settings. So having this group to get together and share this, what they're hearing in reports to say, this is an issue that's showing up. Let's get more training on this. Let's get clear about this. Let's sit down with the Ministers Association to get a better clarity about how ministers and musicians should work together, whatever the issues might be. So that annual learning community thing is written into the new rules, mm -hmm. not written into the current rules. Christina, uh, I want to add something, and maybe this gets more at what you were um, asking about. <clears throat> um, in the current language, in the guidelines, uh, we refer to colleagues, and that definition is minister to minister. Um, and we have not changed the language um, to say our our religious professional colleagues or our music professional colleagues, they are characterized as staff in the current language. And so I appreciate your bringing that up because that could be an important language change to help us get away from our learned hierarchy that separates out ordained clergy from other colleagues. Yeah, I, think, I, I do. I, I think it's um, as we see more and more and learn more about, about shared ministry and about shared leadership, um, the idea of minister and staff um, becomes more and more problematic in terms of just reinforcing the, as you said, the hierarchical nature of, of what quote unquote church is. Um, and you know, being able to break out of that, you know, part of that is is naming it, right? Just like naming it the way we want it to see it exist in the world. <laughs> As Matthew was just saying, you know, even if it isn't there yet, you know, making it until we're making it. Um, and and that's my deep desire for for when these conversations happen is. Um, you know, even when the UUA redesigned their website, um, I was part of a, a test run of the different categories in, in the UUA website, and it was ministers and staff, you know, under, and, and uh, like the first thing I said, is, can we please stop in so many um, congregational websites when you go to their websites, it's ministers and staff, and that just precludes thinking about ministry in a different way. Yeah, I wanna add, um, somebody uh, asked, uh, they made this point about um, the policy and the culture shift and, and about creating mechanisms to make sure those suffering, um, that that suffering stops. And I just do wanna lift up, that's one of the things we've added to the guidelines is that the right relations guide can call the person, the minister in this case, who is misconducting or causing harm and tell them to stop. And a failure to abide by that instruction immediately and fully constitutes egregious misconduct that can lead to the removal of fellowship. Um, so we are taking that super seriously because, you know, that it's that don't police me. I get to say what I want kind of attitude. You know, you can't tell me to stop doing things. Yes, we can. If you're causing ongoing harm, you have got to stop. Stop first, and then let's talk about how to heal, repair, get you back on track. But stop first. Time out. It's so, also about who you believe. Yeah. Sorry, Matthew, because yeah. I think part of what I found is the gaslighting. So I have posted in the chat that I was yelled at by a white woman minister, and her. So the interpretation is I did something to deserve it. So it's also about the believing that if I, I did nothing, this was years ago. And if I did anything about it, I would have hurt my career. I know that um, because that's what we know as village educators. We've heard stories of 
religious educators being yelled at by ministers, being belittled in staff meeting, um, being threatened with their jobs. There is, we hear these stories, I'm a good officer, and, and it makes one want to weep and your heart hurts. And these are same ministers that win awards for sermon prizes or are held up by, because those ministers get to give a narrative of, well, I get called a difficult DRE or a difficult uh, religious educator or people, uh, well, they crossed the line and they didn't know, people stopped short of saying they didn't know their place, whoever we're talking about, the musician, the staff person. So to me, the addition of the cult, part of the culture shift is who to believe. That is, you guys are all making amazing points and I don't want to dismiss this at all. And the reality is that as of this moment, the UUMA can only make guidelines for ministers. <laughs> like that's, that's all we got. <laughs> um, and we can't, we can hold ministers accountable to that. But until we get the common ethics panel, we don't have that authority. Um, uh, yeah, I want to just add too that, you know, John Lou and I have been in ministry, and she's been a little longer than I have, but we've been doing this a while. And, and I have seen a culture shift, like I've actually seen the shift ha occurring. And I just want to lift that because, you know, we had this conversation, I don't even remember how many years ago it was about, you know, whether or not um, clergy could have relationships with members of the congregation. And it was a heated conversation. I mean, it was conflictual and difficult and hard and people had lots of things to say about it and we wound up with this really sort of fuzzy thing that came out of it that said well you're not supposed to but if you do here's how you should do it um and and that's not where we want to be um and i've seen you know since that conversation you know maybe it's new folks coming in the education through the seminaries is better we've learned more as a as a people as a society we have a better understanding of what's happening in the world and how we fit into that um, and you know the me too movement is all part of that and i think we are we are a learning institution or we'd like to be a learning institution and i think if if we continue to frame that way we'll continue to move in the right direction i just want to say that i have seen some changes we're clearly not where we'd like to be um, but but i've seen certainly um, newer folks coming in with a much better analysis and a much better understanding than what I came in with um, through my uh, through my educational process. So, and could I say I've really learned from religious educators? I mean, the first time I went to Lareda, and people stood up after someone spoke and asked questions that were actual questions, like that they were curious about and wanted answers for, instead of like grandstanding and those kinds of things, I thought, oh, wow, there's something happening here in Lareda that we as ministers need to learn about because people, people are being more real, they're being more authentic, they're setting aside ego in a way that ministers, mm, we have trouble doing. Mm -hmm. So I want to give credit to religious educators and to Lareda for some of my learnings around how do we do this stuff. Yeah. I want to jump in here to uh, John Lou, sort of dovetailing on that point. Um, our, you know, our board president, Cheryl M. Walker, has been saying it's a new day at the UUMA, right? And so that's not just a slogan, right? There's real stuff about that. And what's real about it is this very notion that's come up, that's perked up a couple of times that we aren't going to be this learned ministry anymore, which is just this very white word that sets us apart from everybody else and presumes nobody else is learned, which we know is completely false. Um, and 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 secondly, that as a learning um, as a learning ministry, we are appreciating that not solely, but that we are a part of the leaders and the keepers of a transformative tradition that will not survive unless we work our stuff out. Mm -hmm. And so there is a line in, in the 24 pages that I think gets at the essence of this, which is that these shifts are about making our covenant real. And mm -hmm. so it's not to, 
as opposed to, as, as Matthew highlighted this, you're either in or you're out, but it's this place of, we are in this thing and we want to restore, you know, we want to bring you into a restorative circle. We're universalists also. You're not being cast out, but friend, you've got some work to do, right? As Teresa Soto, Soto says, you're loved, you're worthy, and you need a little work. I mean, who among us doesn't fit that description? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that's huge. And, and to Paul's point, you know, that, you know, our guidelines have been less than stellar. Yes, they've been less than stellar. And they're, they're more importantly, they're less than we deserve, than we mm -hmm. all deserve if, if we're going to help this thing survive. And I want to just, I, I, I am she, so excited for the idea of this. I want to say that as the minister of CLF, a lot of people come to us because of broken relationships with clergy elsewhere. And mm. I have been not even allowed to listen to them pastorally without feeling in violation of guidelines. So I've sent them to other teammates who are not ordained to talk to, but that feels so horrible that I can't even, it's felt like listen to them pastorally. And some of them have come in complete trauma and I have listened to them, but I've always wondered if I'm quote allowed to. And then I'm right. certainly not allowed to call my colleague and say what happened. Uh, so, you know, I feel like because in order to do that, I would have to report them or, I, you know, it, it's just, it's felt like we're moving from policing in my opinion to accountability in a way. So if people start talking about policing coming in, I think they're, they're actually just, as people have said, talking about losing a little bit of privilege, but, but the system we have is all about policing. I see a couple people trying yeah. to come in, Matthew. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to ask. Asia, oh, can, I, can I go next, please? Um, Asia, I wanna go, before we get too much further, uh, I wanna go back to a point that I don't, I don't think uh, we've fully addressed. And that was um, the fact that you and others in your position have been uh, emotionally abused. And um, right now, there's not much to do about it. There isn't even language to be able to articulate what happened. And so this is, has been a big problem with bullies and emotional abusers. And I feel that we've taken a very important step forward in naming this behavior and in uh, an addendum, we have described in detail uh, the different, some very subtle and insidious ways in which this behavior uh, takes place. Because um, I heard too many stories about women in positions, uh, say they were an associate minister or director of religious education serving under a white senior minister. And in some cases, this power goes to their heads and they obviously they have some uh, background that leads them to uh, this kind of behavior to manipulate people and to uh, just just shave away at a person's self-esteem. And the results are devastating and traumatic. So finally, we are going to have a, a way of naming it and addressing it. And I think it's so important. So um, yeah, uh, Meg, I want to sort of follow up on your comment a little bit about what happens afterwards. Um, I'm an after pastor. A number of my predecessors in my uh, current setting um, committed what today we would clearly consider clergy sexual misconduct. And that's, I'm sure I'm not the only one on this call uh, <laughs> for whom that is true. Um, and our culture of secrecy around this is just devastatingly bad. So the new rules um, prohibit the minister's association from failing to disclose to successor colleagues misconduct which has happened in the settlement before. They do not allow that to continue. Um, and um, that comes out of direct conversations um, with Deborah Popelance and others about the consequences of misconduct and how pulling off that Band-Aid and being clear about that. So you don't walk in, minister doesn't walk into a setting and not know that the previous minister or the minister three ministers ago. And it'll take a while for the culture to catch up with this, but um, that's a really important um, piece of this. And the po point about healing, 
um, and being responsive to um, all kinds of colleagues who are serving in a setting where misconduct has happened and, and helping people get back because it's devastating to a congregation. It messes up what the ministry is for and what the church is for and what the faith is for. It turns it into this narcissistic way of people meeting their own needs instead of serving the cause of love, which is larger than any one of us and larger than our needs, thank God. You know, there are a couple you know, things that I'm, go, oh, sorry, uh, that I'm uh, noticing about culture change. And I, I'm so glad that, that you all started with the sense that we really needed to deeply change the culture um, in the UUMA, in the UUA, that all these things are connected to one another. And, I, you know, so two things I want to note. One is um, if you've read Ibram Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning, and I know Asia is a big fan of that book, um, Kendi notes that culture change, at least on the national level, often follows uh, policy change. Um, and that sometimes you need to make that policy change in order to drive the culture change. So I'm very hopeful that this will be another example of that. Uh, and the second thing is in, in the, the little UU universe, uh, sometimes great things happen when the right people are all in the room together. Um, you know, I noticed when I was uh, the president of Allies for Racial Equity and Clyde Grubbs was the president of DRUM and we were both on the UUA board together. Um, we were able to push together in ways that um, maybe other people couldn't have. Uh, and so like, I just want to hold up that Wendy, you're the incoming president of the UUMA and Asia is the president, will be the president elect of Lareda. Uh, and so it also seems like, you know, it made me happy to hear Asia that you were consulted uh, on, on the draft here, like the right people uh, can be in the room if we're intentional about that. And I had one question um, that I want to get to before the hour is up. I will not be in Spokane. Um, I can't make it to Spokane uh, this year. Uh, I want to make sure I vote for this. Is there, I, I want to be very practical. Is there a way that I, as a UUMA member, can make sure I vote for this and support this, even if I'm not at ministry days in Spokane? And I don't know who gets to answer that one. Christiana? Go, go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, so any, I believe all UUMA delegates, all UUMA members are automatically delegates. Is that right? Those who've attended GA more than me, <laughs> I believe that is the case. Yeah. Um, and online registration is available and open as of, I think like a month ago. Um, so I am told there are four people registered online as of yesterday that will be online delegates. So all of you should get over there and register immediately and so i can register online to vote at ministry days as well yes. yep mm -hmm. ministry days a very large portion of it is okay live streamed i'll do that then and <laughs> yes make sure you do that yep and tell everyone you know <laughs> we yeah, are into the top of the hour i want to spend uh time uh, promoting this and spreading the word and talking to people about it. It's very important. We're coming to the top of the hour. I'm sorry I keep talking over people. I can't see everybody, so I can't always see when someone else is trying to say something. Um, but let's, because there are many of you and seven minutes, give each of you a last word. So um, let us start with, oh gosh, um, Wendy, let's start with you and just a quick word and pass it to someone else. Really, I'm just so excited. I do think this gives us a chance uh, to make our covenant real with each other and to live into a better version of ourselves and the one that we and um, the one that our ancestors might not have thought to have for us, but that we can think to have for the folks for whom we will be ancestors. And I will turn it to my colleague, Christana. Um, I'm really glad for this opportunity. Thank you all. And um, I also just want to leave everyone with the knowledge that the view may be ending, but the conversation will not. I know I and our other colleagues that are in these groups will welcome any opportunities to talk to folks, Facebook, telephones, texts, whatever methodology works for you. Um, and in person, if that's available. So anything we can do to help parse out these 24 pages, uh, we will do our best to do. So please be in touch if there's any questions that have not yet been answered. 
which I'm sure there are. Um, John Alou. I just want to point out as kind of a symbol of the culture change that two of those 24 pages are the old guidelines completely crossed out. So, uh, Paul. Um, I, I just want to publicly recognize the committees that I've been working with in the ethics committee. Um, you know, we spent the last 18 months or so working really hard to put this all together and the committee's been fantastic. We've done some really great work. I'm, I am indeed proud of the work that we've done. Uh, and I look forward to seeing many of my colleagues in Spokane who are supportive of this document uh, and to seeing this change happen in our, um, in our collegial circles. And I also wanna just quickly add that we're gonna have a UUMA conversation at the end of May. I'm not sure what the date is. So if you're a UUMA member and would like to join that conversation, Keep your eyes peeled. We'll have something scheduled for that. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, let's do Matthew. Yeah, thanks everybody for uh, making the space. Thank you, Meg, for uh, making the space to have this conversation. And I hope people will watch it um, later as well as having watched it live so they can learn more and ask some of these questions. So great that you do this. Um, I see, I do see that um, we've seen some questions about UMA membership. And I want to say just a quick word about that before the hour's up. Um, our, we do imagine um, that you, to be in fellowship as a Unitarian Universalist minister means to be a member of the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. That doesn't mean that that's the only way people do ministry. That's a different question. But to be in fellowship as a UU minister um, with the association means to be a member of the association. The, the part of the reason for that is that when people have broken the covenant of ministers and been an attempt at accountability has been tried, they just quit their membership in UUMA. Um, that can't continue. Sometimes that leads to an MFC investigation, but you got to stay a member. And we know and the executive team of the UUMA knows that that means really thinking about um, the cost um, and the cost of dues and making sure that the sliding scale for community part-time, et cetera, ministers is really working well so that finances are not um, keeping people from participating. But the coaching, the right relations guide, the healing fund for repair, all that's gonna come out of UUMA members um, out of our dues. So um, people need to participate in the system of accountability in order to be accountable. And that's just gotta be non-negotiable. Sorry, uh, John and Lou, I think, right? Yeah. I already talked, but I don't know that Kim has. Kim. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the, the hosts of VIEW for having all of us here today. It's been a wonderful opportunity and I think a great conversation. And uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, you folks out there had a chance to hear us today. Um, I, I also wanna thank the members of the committee that I work with. Uh, they all have all worked really hard and done a great job. Um, you know, All the interviews and, and the editing, it's been a ton of work, but uh, we all feel really good about it. And um, there, during ministry days, uh, we are going to be having a collegial conversation and our study guide will be available at that time. So if you are a minister and you're going to be at ministry days, I hope that you will plan to attend. Um, and uh, finally, I am so excited about Really, I, you know, like like many of us, I can be cynical about change, but I really am hopeful, and I really believe that this is the cusp of a cultural change, not only for our ministers, but I believe it's going to ripple out throughout Unitarian Universalism as we set forth a model for higher standards of ethical behavior. Um, it's going to benefit all of us. And so I'm, I'm extremely excited to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to lift up that there are many questions we didn't get to answer today that UUMA leadership more generally will be with us in two weeks. And so come back those questions about the Society for Larger Ministry, about accountability with religious educators, all kinds of good stuff that we did not get to uh, get to. Please come back in two weeks. Meanwhile, next week we have Glenn Thomas Rideout and Ro Far Farrar talking about music. Uh, and so that'll be great too. And I always wanna give the last word to the teachers among us. Christina and Aisha, you got a final word? 
I'm so very appreciative because uh, I do think it's going to shift our um, our culture. When we were working on the book centering, our conversations were extraordinary. And I said, if we ha- we we need to care and love our spiritual leaders, and we need to hold them accountable because what's happening in our congregations of staff is be- is being treated this way. So thank you for this work, Christina. Yeah, I will echo the thanks. This this is the product of clearly lots and lots of time and effort and love of Unitarian Universalism. And that at the heart and center of our faith um, is, is the culture shift that we need. And I just am really, really excited to see what's going to come out of this. And um, as somebody who's joining the Laureated Board with Asia, um, I really look forward to working with you all and Aum and the membership network and um, the AUA in, in looking and seeing how this is going to take us where we need to go in our future as Unitarian Universalism. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. See you later.